Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, California Resources Corporation, Kern County Water Agency, Southern California Edison, Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, and Panama Buena Vista Union School District. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael. And I'm Chuck. Give us a call today. Our phone tuners are here until 5.30. You can call us here in Bakersfield at 636-4357. San Luis Obispo and outlying areas, you can call toll free at 1-866-636-6284. You can email us questions at dothemath at kern.org. You can watch the show online at dothemathonline.net. And you can look for us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right. Well, you know what? We want to, first of all, congratulate the fifth grade class at Noble Elementary with Mr. Knox as they won the fifth grade call-in contest. And we'll be uh, checking out a little bit of the activities nice. from yesterday with those guys later on during the program. We do have phone tutors available until 530 this afternoon. And today's Math in the News we're going to go right into it right now. So yeah. today's Math in the News. Today's Math in the News, a special edition. <laughs> Jerry's in studio with us today. How are you? I'm all right, sir. Now, you're here because it was, it must have been maybe a month ago. About that, yeah. I was walking around downtown Bakersfield for First Friday. And First Friday is where they've got a lot of artisans out on the street and showing the different types of arts and crafts that they do and produce. And restaurants have specials going on, trying to get more people involved in the downtown scene, as well as highlight some artists and what they produce. And I was walking along, then I ran into you and your booth. <laughs> and, uh, as soon as I saw the things on the table, I was I caught my eye. I was fascinated and then inquired as to how you make these. And what started coming out of your mouth at that time, if you remember? Well, you know, basically how you calculated uh, the segments and, and go into these. Uh, these are all made up of different pieces that are glued together and you have to have the angles right and things like that. Uh, and as soon as I heard that come out of your mouth, I said, all right, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get you on the program one day, and I'm certainly glad that you were able to come by today. I'm glad to do it. So explain to us how, so you take it right from the beginning. Okay. There are a lot of people, you know, they, they see wooden bowls, and this is what we usually think of when we think of wooden bowls. But okay. the problem with wooden bowls like this is that think of the size of the chunk of wood that you have to have and how much of this that you're throwing away. And if you get into things like most of this is... So let me uh, hold this one up to yeah, camera three over most here of quickly the, so you can see what... A lot of these woods, or most of these woods, are exotic South American woods, and many of these run up, you know, like $30 a board foot. Okay. As opposed to, you know, five or six for, say, maple or walnut. And so to buy a chunk of that, we're talking hundreds of dollars now to make a bowl. Whereas if you take and make segmented bowls, once you take and make rings out of the segments and then you glue, sand them flat and glue these rings together, you don't have all this waste in here. Right. And so this gives you the economy as well as the fact that you can make different patterns. In right, so we can see on that. Like different types of woods. 
Uh, I have some bowls that I've made may have as many as nine different kinds of wood in it. And we can see also, because I know, I mean, hopefully you can see the detail on the outside of that, and then looking at it also on the inside, and hopefully you can kind of get an idea of the detail and the pattern that you've got going on in this. You're pretty much limited by your imagination, and that's about it. Okay. So, um, so you want to go in how, to, how you... Exactly, how okay. this all happens. Okay, so we wanted to make one of these segmented rings. Okay. And you can make, it's nice that you have some of these things up here because basically you have a segment, you know, back here. Um, if you look at some of these, if I can get them apart. There we go. So we're okay. Down. Okay. And all you have to remember is two basic things. Number one, a circle has 360 degrees in it. Okay. And you have to know how to be able to calculate the circumference. So you have to remember pi. And that, you know, pi d is going to give you your circumference of the circle. So simply knowing those formulas, because there are students that are being introduced to geometry in elementary school. Right. And one of the first things they need to know are the number of degrees, as you said, in a circle, 360 right. in a triangle, 180. 180. And uh, the different parts of a circle and the formulas. Right. So this is how you go right about it. Yeah, basically in this we're just going to be concerned about making segments. So we're not doing a lot of these other things. Um, and to, to do that, you can, there are several ways you can go about cutting these segments. But the thing that you want to make sure of is these segments are going to fit together. And you can make the difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, without the overlap and the gaps. And yes, yeah, I mean, if they don't fit together nicely like this, you've got big gaps showing or they're skewed off, you know, center or, mm -hmm. you know, and you wind up with something that looks like this. <laughs> this Instead is, of the, this, yeah, the this is before it's turned. product, right? But you, you turn it and it still looks like this mm -hmm. if the angles aren't right. So uh, you can make these segments. I tend to make almost exclusively 12 segment rings okay. to glue together. And you simply make these segments and glue these all together. Uh, and you can do this with any number of segments from four, you know, out to as many as, as you can go and still well, measure the, the angle. Yeah. The graph that you've got here, you've yeah. got them going from four all the way to 40. Right. And there are people who turn bowls, especially with open segment bowls, we won't talk about that, but there is something called open segment turning. And a lot of those will use 32 segments per ring. And so you have to be able to calculate, okay, if I want to put 32 segments in there, what does that angle have to be? And, and I don't know if we can see here, we'll uh, go down, but 32 segments. Right. You know that it's going to have to be 11.25 for degrees the angle. for right. that angle. For that angle. And that needs to be exact. And it needs to be exact. If you're off of a tenth of a degree, and we talked before, if you're off of a tenth of a degree when you cut that segment, now multiply that by 32 because that's what you're going to wind up with when you get to the thing. And you're going to wind up with a bunch of void spaces or pieces that just won't fit in. What are one of the tools that you use to make sure okay. that you are making sure all of this works out to be exact? I'd like to take credit for this, but I can't. Uh, a gentleman yeah, how about the, if I hold it? Yeah, a gentleman by the name of Jerry Bennett came up with this, and it's called a wedgie sled. Um, but you can cut these in different ways. I started out cutting them actually on a, on a chop saw. And a chop saw is nice for 12 segment rings oh, because yeah. it cuts, it has a stop at 15 degrees. Because when you cut the segment, you gotta remember it's a 30 degree angle, but you're cutting one side of it and you have two sides to the thing. So your saw has to be set at 15 degrees if you're gonna do this on a chop saw. And when you get done then cutting the two sides, you'll have you 30, know it's be you have 30 degrees. Okay. So, uh, so a chop saw will work. But the problem with a chop saw is the first thing you know, you have a piece of wood catch in it and a chop saw you've seen it. Basically a chop saw is just a table saw stood, stood on end. But it has a yoke that allows you to line the thing, the wood up so that you have a 90 degree presented to the blade. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the first time you have a piece of wood catch in there, you may not notice it, but you've bent that yoke. And, so and now that is thing now is, off. is off from forever now. The nice thing about this is that you don't have to worry about this. Let's put our 
slow us all back on okay. here. And what we're going to do is we set this up to be able to run this on a table saw. And it's just simply a piece of MDF board. And it has some bolts and these two guides. And it, I've routed these out to where these things will swing back and forth. Okay. And when we do this, we make this and we put a thing on the bottom, these miter slots. And you might wonder why we don't just use the miter gauge that came with this thing. Well, if you look at a miter gauge, it's going to be pretty obvious that how are you going to measure, you know, a 15 degree or 12 degree right, segment when you're on going here. These intervals yeah, that, like I that. mean, it's just, and the other thing is, is that you stick this miter gauge in this slot and it does this. Okay. Because they're just not that exact. And the fact, too, that blades are very seldom exactly 90 degrees to the miter slot. And so this presents another problem now. And the blade rarely is exactly 90 degrees per vertical or perpendicular. So you have to be able to do something to overcome all those things. Mm -hmm. And the thing you have to remember is in a, in a saw that the blade is, is like a lawnmower. Okay. It just cuts. It's indiscriminate. It doesn't care whether it's this way or that way. It, doesn't it, go. it just goes through it. This miter slot, on the other hand, will control everything angular. But you have to make sure that you don't get this wobbling in the thing and that this slit is exactly the same angle as your blade and the same perpendicular cutoff as your blade. So what you do when you make this, and this is just MDF board, and, and it's cut out, and you cut a little piece of wood, and you polish it so it slides easy. Mm -hmm. And this goes into the miter slot. And when you first do this, you make this so that this miter slot is going to put this actually over the edge of the blade. Because what we want to do is when we get all these things put up, we want to take this now and run this through the blade so now everything is exactly up against okay. the blade. And that takes care of all the problems with that blade maybe not being quite... You've got it set right on track. setting with the want. world, right, okay. right. And so it's easy to do when you cut 12 segment rings that they're nice because you need a 30 degree angle, okay? So all you really need is that if you have go down to a, any hobby store and you can buy one of these 30, 60, 90... Pick one up because pick if that's one up, the angle you need... They're, they're not expensive and I don't know if you can see this, but if you take these things... Here, let's put it right over towards camera three. I'll hold it up and you can okay. kind of maneuver it. Right. But what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to put these in so that these, ang this, these angles are... Hmm, I said so. And we want to make sure that that's in there very tight. Snug. Now we can tighten this down. Okay. And now we have the sled set. Got it. Okay. okay. So now we can take this, and, and this is going to run through your saw like so. We just take a board, and we mark it on one side. Okay. And on one edge. And the nice thing about this wedgie sled is the fact that I could cut them just using this one fence that we have here. And we have there different people did different ways. One thing you have to make sure of is that all of these wedges that you're going to cut are the same length. Mm -hmm. Okay. Doesn't matter so much the width here. They can be the boards can be different widths. They really need to be about the same thickness, although we can sand that down if there's a little difference when okay. we get done. But they have to be, you know, the same width when you cut them or they don't fit. Because 12 segments in the ring, if they they angle, you're, off, it, a they, if you're off a little bit, it's it. So what we do is we set this up on the other side of the saw blade and this acts as a saw stop. And so we move this. Okay, gotcha. Can you hold that right mm -hmm. there? And, and we do this, and the saw blade is in between, and all we have to do is just take this and until, it, until it hits that, and then we can run it through the blade, okay. and we'll cut that segment. When we do that, 
If I wanted to cut these, and I'll do it all, all on this fence, all I have to do now is flip the board over and put it through the, the uh, saw again, and we have two wedges that will fit together. However, you can still be off a little bit with this. It's more accurate than doing it on a chop saw or trying to use a miter gauge or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But if we do this and we, and we cut this one, and now we move this up here and we cut this one, this is the complementary angle to what we have down here. And so you know that if they're off a little bit in here somewhere, or you know, it, it's not exactly, they're gonna cancel each other out. And when they do that, then you know that those segments are gonna be perfect. You don't have to do a test ring or anything else. You can just go in, set this, and start cutting segments. But you know what? This is fascinating right now. We've kind of got the basics right now. Yep. What we're going to do is we're going to head out live right now to College Heights Elementary and visit with Devin and the assortment of students that he's got out there, and then we're going to get back to some more of this. So, sticking around? Sure. All right. Devin, how are you guys? Doing great, Mike. Glad to see everything is going well. A lot of constructive work going on at the studio. We have a lot of work going on here at College Heights Elementary. I'm here with Angelina, fifth grader here at College Heights. Angelina, welcome to do the math. It's good to see you. So we were talking a little bit about uh, fractions work, and a lot of the work that the fifth graders are doing right now lives in fractions. So we took a look at one of the problems from uh, Angelina's homework. Go ahead and tell us a little bit about this problem, Angelina. Um. You have to multiply and put it in simplest form. So multiplying fractions and putting them in simplest form. Now traditionally, there's there's the general way that teachers multiply these fractions. Could you show us how you would normally just multiply these fractions here? Um, so tell me what you did there to get to three fifteenths here. Um, I just um, multiply cross. So. Multiplying across, and that's generally the way that you'll get to that initial fraction before you have to simplify it. And there's a whole way of simplifying fractions, but what a lot of students struggle with is, why is this 3 fifteenths? So what we're going to do is we're going to explore area models to understand why 3 fifteenths is the product of these two fractions. So you've done area before. When you've had those rectangles and it's, let's say, 5 across and 2 high. Okay, this is not the scale, this is a poor rectangle, I understand that. So what this really is, is two rows and five columns. So we would figure out how many square units are inside that rectangle, which is 10, which means that all we really need to do is just multiply those together. So let's do the same thing. But instead of doing the whole rectangle, we're only going to do three-fifths of the rectangle. So let's break this up into five parts. And of those five parts, how many of them do we need for the whole length? Three. Three, right? This is, we only want three out of the five, three-fifths, the, the part versus the whole. So let's go ahead and shade out three-fifths of this rectangle, okay? Now, let's look at this other fraction here, one-third. So how are we going to break the height of this fraction into this appropriate part? Um, you make... <laughs> Three lines, like, represent. Okay, so we have three rows here. Now, out of those three rows, how many of them do we want shaded in? Uh, one. Just one, right? One out of the three. So let's go ahead and I'll, like, you know, I'll let you pick. Which row do you want to do? Top, middle, bottom. It doesn't really matter. Um, bottom. Let's do the bottom, okay? So I'll go ahead and shade this in. Now, as we do it in a different direction, you're going to see that some of those boxes have crosses in, which means that those are the boxes that are covered by both the three-fifths and the one-third. Now, how many of these smaller boxes make up the whole rectangle? Fifteen. We have fifteen, right? Five rows of three, three rows of five, however you want to gauge it. So we have fifteen, which is going to be our denominator. How many of those fifteen are covered by both the three-fifths and the one-thirds? Three. Three, right? One, two, three. Three-fifteenths. Three-fifteenths. Now, of course, there is a matter of simplifying a fraction. So we think of simplifying as just another way of representing the same value. So what we can do is we can rearrange this. Let's go ahead and take a look at that fraction, 3 fifteenths. Now let's get our original rectangle that was broken up into 15 parts here. Okay. And we'll have another color here for the rows. 
Now, what is another way that we can organize three out of these 15 so that parts are filled in completely, either across or down? Um, down. Okay, so you want to fill in three of these going down, right? Which column would you like to fill in? I feel like we're playing Hollywood Squares here. That is an <laughs> old reference that I don't think any of our viewers are going to get. Our hosts, you got it. That's for you. So which one of these do we want to fill in here? I got that too. I'm not jumping. Let's fill in which one of these columns. First, second, third, fourth, fifth? Fifth. Yeah. Fifth, last column. Not that last column, right? So let's go ahead and shade that in. Green. Now I've put these different colors so that I can move these lines a little bit separately, but what did we end up filling in in this fraction? One fifth. This is one Fifth. Three fifteenths is the same thing as one fifths. So Angelina, what we're going to do right now is use this concept to do another multiplication problem with fractions. So let's try this. I have your rectangle and I have your problem. What you're going to be doing is one eighth times three fourths. So I'm going to go ahead and have you work this out and explain what you're doing as you're doing it. Okay. Let's start off with the one eighth. What would you need to do to get one eighth of the across rectangle. Um, you put, make eight columns. Okay. You want to keep in mind the space, so you don't want to draw too wide. Keep going. You want to make sure you have eight parts, so you should probably only draw seven lines here. Okay, let's count one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's get one more over there. How many of those do you want to shade in? One. Let's shade in one, okay? Now, for three-fourths, we're going to have to break this into how many parts across? So with three fourths, how are we going to work on that? Three fourths, um, you put the D across. So we're going to need three out of how many across? Four. So let's go ahead and color those in. Same way. All right. Now, how many squares do we have here? We have. You may have to count, but you can also multiply the denominators together, right? Um, Eight times four. There's more than one way to do multiplication. Thirty-five. Thirty. Is it thirty-five? We only added eight columns, so this is going to be thirty-two. But how many of these are covered by both the blue and the red? Um, three. Three. 3 out of 32. Now, if you go the old way of just multiplying across, 1 times 3 is 3. 8 times 4 is 32. Angelina, do you have to ask anybody if you're right? Because we did the math. Back to you in the studio. Nicely done right there. A couple of different ways to multiply those fractions. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 530. Right now, we can continue with our artisan lesson today. <laughs> so, what's next? Okay, well, just to show how these go together, th these are uh, 12 segments that were all cut using a, a, a sled, uh, okay. like I've had there, and if you notice, if you squeeze these together, and we're not going to put a band on it right now, because we're going to do some other things, but you notice how well those fit together, because everything's exactly 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. All these are cut at 30 degrees. Now, here are some little pieces of uh, I cut, and they're just basically perfectly 90 degrees all the way around. Okay. They're the same thickness of oh, I, I can take and put these in here like so and you notice that they all still fit. And the reason being is I haven't changed anything angularly in here at all. All I've done now is expanded expand, right? okay. the diameter of this ring by so based on how wide you want the ring you have to calculate if how you're many yeah, how, how you're going, okay. and whether you're going to put any decoration in it like this has to be thought uh, in, in advance as well. Now here's some another trick that you can do. Here's some that are cut at an angle, and if I, if I don't one. knock them all off, uh, that's okay. Let me grab here another one of these. Uh, so if you if you notice that these are not cut. At a 30 degree angle. They're, Here, they're, we'll put them down underneath the camera a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and, and you can't. So if I add this like so, it's, it's going to change my angular thing, right? Okay. But let's make complementary angles. Let's take this one 
and stick this in here like so. And then we'll turn this one around yeah, this way, way okay. and put this in like so. And now, if I was to stick another couple in up here, which I should, okay. they'd all still fit. Right. Because if you put these two together like so, you have exactly the same thing as that, it's just thicker. So you can use that for decoration. If you want, you can take pieces of wood and say you glue a strip of wood on here that's the same width about, and you glue this on here flat, and then what you get is something like this when okay. you cut your segments because you know it, that now is a part of the wood. Okay. And uh, it comes out. To set this and make sure, here's, here's a, using this triangle, and this is a, a sled that I made, and it's fixed. You can't change this because mm -hmm. I tend to cut. And I'm of the opinion that anytime you get places where you can adjust, something will something will go, go wrong. Okay. <laughs> if it can, so it will. So you made this permanently. So this is the way permanently you want. fixed, and it's a, it's at a 30 degree angle. But if I wanted to cut other segments, I could use this other sled that we talked about that is has variable on it, and these are not terribly expensive. You can buy them on eBay or any number of sites on, online. These are digital protractors. And if I take and zero this, and if I was to turn this on, and it's pretty much zeroed, if I stick this in here, like so, and I push this up until, until this fits in here, exactly like so, and well, we're a hundred tall. Nice and snug. So you're 29.9. So let's see. Well, we're 29.9 there, there. So we're 30. Exactly, exactly. 30. Just okay. needed to right. expand it a little now, bit. Now, let's go to this chart here. And if you noticed, we said like a 32 degree. We need 12, I mean 32 segments. We need 12 degree segments. If we want to put 32 segments in a ring, each segment has to be cut at 12 degrees. So what we can really do is take this adjustable one now and, and, and we can set this at 12 degrees and I'm, well, I'm not going to do that right now. But then you, but you can stick also. that in there and you adjust these. I think this is a tool that most of the students haven't seen. This is a digital um, uh, it's a digital protractor, protractor uh -huh. to show the angle and it's very, very precise. I see what, how many decimals? Well, it goes out to, to two decimals. Two on decimals. decimals. They, they make ones that are better. Uh, I like to say, uh, like the saw I showed, the saw I showed, mm -hmm. it's not the one I use. Um, cheap has a bad connotation, mm -hmm. <laughs> but frugal's good. Inexpensive. Inexpensive. Fru frugal's yeah. good, so I have yeah. frugal equipment, yes. you know, and, and uh, it works quite well. Well, we've got about two more minutes. Okay. So what can we take a look at next? Well, I don't know that we can see this or not. Um, well, one thing I found fascinating is you have students that you work with and yeah. finding the center. Right. So if you want to talk about that just a sure. little bit. One of the easiest ways to find the center, of course, is that if you just take and draw a line from here to here, you know, if you come through with a, a straight edge, and somewhere I have a pencil in one yeah, of these here. things. Yeah. If we have a straight edge, you know, we can we can take and, and draw this like so from corner to corner and turn it like so from corner to corner. And there's your center. But an easier way to do that, you can get these online. They're, they're very inexpensive. And what it is, essentially, it's a 90 degree angle. It's like a square. And they've taken the 45 and run the 45 mm -hmm. degree angle from it. And if you put that in there and look, you're right on. The lines line right up. And so all you have to do is just put it on two sides. This works with the perfect square. If you have a parallelogram, for example, it, it doesn't. Gonna... So what you do then is that you can take and you can just run this on all four sides and like so. And you're going to come up with a little square in the center. And you can actually just, for our purposes, put a dot in the center of that and you're going. Because it's only going to be about, you know, so big, you know. The other thing that you can use this for is that uh, we put this back up here. Determining the center of a circle and to determine the center of a circle, you can go to a lot of trouble and if it's, you know, it, make this, you just draw 
a line through any two mm -hmm. points in here and draw another one. And if you then calculate the center point of that line and drop a, a perpendicular down from it and a perpendicular from this, you found the center of the circle. Well, that's easy, except when you get onto a piece of wood, it's not as easy as it sounds. But the one thing you can do is you can take this thing and stick it in here like this against it and draw a line here. And it doesn't matter where you turn this and draw another line. Then you've got it. You've got the center of the All circle. Right. Well, you know what? Certainly is fascinating. The pieces of, uh, I mean, artistry is what this mm -hmm. is. Truly. It's common sense. It's common sense, but it's putting what the students are learning in elementary yeah. and junior high you have and applying it. Yeah, you have to know that there's 180 degrees in a, in a triangle. You have to know that there's 360 degrees in a circle. You have to be able to figure the circumference and all those sorts of things. So you need those formulas if you're going to do this. Now, we've got a first Friday coming up. Right. I met you at the last first Friday. Right. So if there's some people that would like to meet you, where are you in downtown Bakersfield during first Friday? Okay, the first Friday is uh, the first Friday of every month from 5 till 9, and it is on 19th Street between I and Chester. Okay. And it runs from that intersection of I and 19th, a block to Chester, a block, all, essentially all four directions. There are about 100 booths set up. Right, I was going to say, there were a lot, and we, I a, know we didn't even hit all of It's them. amazing the amount of artists that you have here in town. Well, I'm just glad that my wandering around that night brought yeah. me to you and your booth. We're on 19th Street between I and Chester on the north side of the street. All right, well, you know what? We'll have some people definitely go check you out this Friday night. All right. Right now, we're going to go to the phones, and from Noble Elementary, Kaylee, how are you today? Good. And if I'm not mistaken, you won some Condor tickets last week, correct? Yeah. And you know what? You are part of the class, and we're going to have a little uh, segment on your winning class in just a little bit. But first, let's go ahead and take a look at the problem that you're working on today. Okay. Okay, Kayla, go ahead and give me that problem that you're working on. Um, three and two ninths. Three and plus two ninths? Yeah. Plus one and three fourths. One and three fourths. And I'm sorry, you said plus? Plus one and three fourths. Okay, so we're adding two mixed numbers, three and two ninths plus one and three fourths? Yes. Now I'm rotor across horizontally, but I think we're going to do this vertically, okay? So okay. I'm going to put that one and three fourths down here. And let's see if I can get rid of this. And let's go ahead and add these together. So what do we have to do before we can add these two mixed numbers? Um, we have to check if the denominators are the same. Right, so we, it's no problem adding the whole numbers, but we've got to add these fractions together, which means we've got to get the denominators the same, don't we? Denominators so, the same? Yeah, so what's our lowest common denominator that we're going to use to add these two fractions? 24? Well, let's see. We want a lowest common denominator, right? So we want a number that 9 will go into and 4 will go into, right? Uh-huh. So what's the, what's the smallest number, the LCD, the smallest number? Now, remember, the LCD is also sometimes called the LCM, right? Uh -huh. It's a multiple of 9 that's also a multiple of 4. So can you tell me a number that is a multiple of 9 that's also a multiple of 4? 36. 36. And in this case, all we had to do is multiply 9 times 4, didn't we? Yes. So in this case, 30, our LCD 36 was just 9 times 4 because uh -huh. 9 goes into 36, 4 goes into 36. And now all we have to do is get that top number. So what do we have to do to this fraction to change it to something over 36? You have to um, multiply... 2 by 4, and that equals 8 on right. the top. So on the bottom, we did 9 times 4 to get 36, so you have to do the same thing to the top, right? Yeah. That's great. What do we have to times the 4 by? 2 and get 8. 9, right, so on top. And then on the bottom, we have that 3 4, so we went 4 times 9 to get 36, right? Yes. Yeah. Whatever we do to the bottom, we have to multiply on the top. So 3 times 9 is? Um... 27. 27. Okay, now we have our common denominator. We have like fractions. So now we can add our fractions together 
add our whole numbers together and then see if we have to simplify, right? Yeah. So let's see, what is 836 plus 2736? Uh, now let's see, how do we add fractions? You bring down the denominator? Yeah, I'm gonna bring down the denominator, right? We don't add the denominators, right? I'm asking how many 36 do we have? And so what's eight plus 27? 34. Yeah, so 8 and 7, that's 15, so that looks like 35, isn't it? 34. Well, see, but 7 and 7 is 14, and we've got 8 and 7, don't we? Oh. So we've got 35, that, which actually is going to make our problem a little easier, isn't it? Because we've got 35 over 36, and 3 plus 1 is 4, mm -hmm. and can we reduce 35 over 36? See, is there anything that'll go into both 35 and 36? Uh, no. No, because the only thing that's going to 35 would be 1, 5, and 7, and mm -hmm. 7 and 5 don't go into 36, and 1 doesn't help us, does it? So no. it looks like our answer to this problem is 4 and 35, 36, and, whoops, not, not 60. Let me see if, yeah. I, see if I change that here. 35 over 36, and that's going to be our answer, right? Okay. Nicely so done, Kaylee, right there. And if you're still online with us, you've got a prize for having such a wonderful problem this afternoon. You've got a ticket to the final day of the March meets, which is going to be the drag racing out ah, at the right. Raceway. So congratulations on that. Ah, I heard it racing right, <laughs> right there. As a matter of fact, every single student that goes on today is going to get a ticket to the March Meets, the final day on Sunday. We'll be back with more right after this. Today we're in Bakersfield at the Bakersfield Jet Center by Lloyd's Aviation. And right with us today, we've got Steve Lloyd, and what is your official title with Bakersfield Jet Center? I'm the president. So you, yeah. We've got the top guy with us. Uh, right? Today you do, yep. All right. But we got a lot of qualified pilots around here that can do the same thing that I'm going to talk about today. Well, let me ask you this. How many pilots do you have employed? Primer, we have two full-time guys uh, besides myself and then as-needed pilots. Okay. Yeah. Now, behind us, we've got a beautiful airplane. Yes. Give us a little bit of information about sure, this. Sure, sure. We'll give you just kind of a quick tour. This is the Cessna. Citation XLS, and this is what's considered to be a mid-size corporate jet. And this carries up to eight passengers and flies as high as 43,000 feet at a speed of right around 500 miles per hour. It has a range of about 1,700 nautical miles, which turns into about 1,900 statute miles or so. So okay, the so difference there's between, a little bit of math in between there, there's there math also. right there. So the, what's, you, know, you can ask your students, what's the difference between a nautical mile and a statute mile? Well, basically, it's about a nautical mile is about 15% more in distance. 5280 for a statute mile and 6,000 and something. A little more. They can get their calculator and figure it out. But okay. in aviation, as in uh, uh, the marine world, we're talking nautical miles. And everything is nautical miles, nautical miles speed, and that. Now, when it comes to elevation above the ground, we're talking feet, not meters. Now, I know that there's a uh, an alphabet that goes with aviation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like M would be Mike and right. November, things like that. It's just a way to be able to identify the alphabet in a way that is constant and everybody understands it. Like this airplane, the call sign on this airplane is N362CA. So we, when we call on the radio, it's 362 Charlie Alpha. Let me ask you this, because a lot of students may ask, all right, we understand the Charlie and the Alpha, but what about the N? Because that's at the beginning of all of these airplanes, right? That's the beginning of all the U.S. registered airplanes. Okay, so there's okay. the difference right there. So right. why? Each country's registration or we call it N number in this country, it starts with a different number. N for the United States, there's either numbers or letters that follow that. Okay. This is a Pratt & Whitney 545W. It produces 4,100 pounds of thrust.
right, well, you know what? One of the great things about working on Do the Math is we get to go out to a lot of different schools. And today we've got Devin out at College Heights Elementary. So let's head back out there and see what kind of math they're working on now. Hey, Mike, thanks a lot. Back here at College Heights, we're with Ashley in the fourth grade. And uh, this whole you know, last few weeks here at College Heights has been a lot of emphasis on fractions. And so we're here with subtraction of fractions. And, and this is one of the, the big areas of challenge is, you know, what do you do with fractions when you can't just subtract the numerator straight across? Because, you know, Ashley, you mentioned that usually what you do with a problem like this is you just switch the fractions around so that you can subtract, right? You would do five, six minus one, six, which isn't really how subtraction works. So we started talking a little bit about what subtraction really is. So we, we think about subtraction how. Usually when teachers say subtract, what do we think of in our head? Like maybe subtraction, it could be like two numbers on the number line. So subtraction isn't just taking away from a given value. It's finding out how far apart two points are on a number line. So let's go ahead and put both of these values on a number line here. Let's take our lowest value, which is 5 6, and put it where it normally would be on a number line. And let's take our greatest value, 1 and 1 6, and put it there. Now the key to solving this subtraction problem, we don't have to regroup. We just have to find out how far apart these are on a number line. So let's find a good number in the middle here, between 5 6 and 1 and 1 6. How about just 1? one hole. So let's find out how far it is from both of our values to the middle and then we can just add those pieces together. So let's think about five sixths. How much could we add to five sixths to get to one? To get to, one. To, get to one hole, yeah. Let me help you out here. What's another way in sixths that we can represent one hole? Six out of six, right? So if we think about five six, we deconstruct it, we decompose it as a series of one sixths added to each other. So how much do we add to five six to get to six six then? One sixth. One sixth. Great. Now, let's talk about this other piece here. You can think about this two ways. How far back do you go from one and one sixth to get to one? Or how much do you add to one to get to one and one sixth? Either way, what is that value going to be to get you there? One sixth, absolutely. So what we've just figured out is we start at five sixths, we go one sixth and one sixth to get to one and one sixth. So my question then is, what is the sum of these two values that we jumped? If we add one sixth plus one sixth, two we get two sixths. And we'd simplify that. We'd look for a common factor to divide by, which looks like it'll be 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1. 6 divided by 2 is 3. 1 and 1 sixth minus 5 sixth is 1 third. Did we have to regroup it all? If we needed to, we would probably borrow 1 here and turn this into, remember, 7 sixths? Because we would have to convert this into an improper fraction, right? Because if we think about this, this is really just 1 plus 1 sixth. So let's go ahead and turn that 1 into 6 sixths. So 6 sixths plus 1 sixth, that's going to get us 7 sixths. We'll work in this box here. And from that, we're subtracting 5 sixths. Well, what is 7 sixths minus 5 sixths? There we go. And just like before, we would simplify reduce and that would work out. Let's try something more with this, okay? Let's give ourselves a little bit more space here. Let's do the magic wipe, the old smart board style. Didn't work at all. I am terrible at this. So let's go ahead and do a new fraction set. That's going on the blooper reel. This does not work for me. Let's try a new fraction. Let's go with, how about seven and one sixth minus four and Five, six. Let's go a little bigger here, okay? Let's put these on a number line, and let's get our fractions down. So we put four and five sixths down here, and seven and one sixth over here. Let's figure out how far apart these are now. How much do you want to add to four and five sixths? Four and five sixths. Maybe I would start with the larger ones, like maybe three. 
You want to add three to four and five sixths? Or do you want to add something smaller so you don't go overboard? I think I should add something smaller so I don't So what would you like to add to four and five sixths? Um, maybe plus two. Let's go by two. The nice thing about the open number line is you get to choose the steps that work for you. So let's add two to this. If we add two to four and five sixths, fraction stays five sixths, and we add four hole and two hole, so six. Wow, we're actually really close. Six and five sixths. How would you like to get to seven and one sixth? Do you want to try to make one big jump and get there, or do you want to go by smaller pieces until you get there? I'm going to go by smaller pieces. Let's go by smaller pieces. So what smaller piece would you like to add to six and five sixths? One whole or one sixth? Um, Let's be clear with our terms, right? Maybe one sixth. Let's add one sixth to that. Because when we do that, we end up with six and six sixths. That six and six sixths is the same thing as one. So six plus one, this now is. And how much do we add to seven to get to seven and one sixth? One sixth. One sixth. So two plus one sixth plus one sixth. We already have our two whole. Add the six together, what's our fraction here? Uh, one plus one six. Equals? Two six. And we reduce that to one third. Open number lines for subtracting mixed numbers saves you a lot of regrouping and saves you a lot of headaches. Actually, nicely done. Back to you, Mike. All right, nicely done with Devin and the kids out there. We'll be back with them one final time later on. But first, we have a uh, problem to work through. Okay. A recipe requires three cups of flour. Three cups of flour, okay. And two eggs. Two eggs. To make eight servings of a cake. Eight servings. All right. How many cups of flour are needed to make 20 servings? Okay, so we're comparing flour to servings, and so over here we, we needed how many cups? How many cups to make 20 servings of the same type of cake? So we don't know how many cups of flour, but we want 20 servings. And we want that rounded to the nearest tenth. Okay, so doesn't sound like the eggs figure into this problem at all. You don't huh? need to worry about the eggs. Alright, so I'm going to compare, and in comparing I'm going to set up some ratios. I'm going to set up three cups to eight servings. And that's going to be the same as, well, I don't know what this is, so let's call that x. x cups to 20 servings. Right. So if I get rid of the uh, if I get rid of the units here and just deal with these fractions, let's see what we have. We have 3 over 8 has got to equal x over 20. So this is a pretty simple proportion problem to solve for x. Right? 3 is to 8 as x is to 20. And I'm going to do that by cross multiplying. And I'm going to get 8x. Let me move this down. 8x is going to equal 3 times 20 is 60. Divide both sides by 8. And it looks like I'm going to get 60 divided by 8. That's pretty close. I can get that to 7. That's 56. And 4 eighths. Let's see, you said decimal. So how about 0.5? Looks like 7.5. And my answer is 7.5 cups of flour. So my units is going to be cups. 7.5 cups of flour to make those 20 servings. All right, nicely done. Thanks for that. Do remember we have phone tutors available until 530 and congratulations once again to the students at Noble Elementary fifth grade classroom. The students in Mr. Knox's class, they won the fifth grade contest last month. Let's check it out. We're here at Noble Elementary School about to visit Mr. Knox's class, the winners of our fifth grade call-in contest. They don't expect us. They have no idea that we're coming. They're probably doing some really wonderful work in there. But let's go ahead and surprise them with their well-earned prizes. Come on in. Good morning, Mr. Knox's class. 
We are here from Do The Math to congratulate you on your victory in the fifth grade calling contest. Congratulations. And we have to say thank you to Isabel, right? We have a lot of thank yous to, to, to hand out. So let's go ahead and start with Isabel. Uh, we have for you a free ticket to Maya Cinemas and a gift certificate to Johnny Rockets. Where's Isabel? Isabel, congratulations. Up next, where's Maria? Where's Maria? Maria is going to get a gift certificate to Johnny Rockets as well as a Do The Math shirt. Excellent job. We have a few more shirts to pass out as well. Um, where is Jerry Tse? Jerry Tse, are you good at catching? Jerry Tse? Jerry Tse. Here we go. Where's Jocelyn? Where's Jocelyn? All right, Jocelyn, here you go. Congratulations, Jocelyn. OK, we have a lot to pass out to uh, Kaylee. Where is Kaylee? OK, so Kaylee, um, with, with your efforts with the program, we're going to be giving you not just a Do the Math shirt, but also a four pass to the Bakersfield Condors. You get four tickets for the Condors. Um, and make sure you contact them to figure out which game you want to go to. Congratulations. Now, we do want to acknowledge Mr. Knox and his work in helping this class be successful. And I believe this is a, a stretch now. This is a, a winning streak. Is this uh, the first year in a row, or how many now? No, I've, this is the first time we've done it. Wow. Well, it's not going to be the last time, I can tell you that. So in order to congratulate your class and your efforts, we're giving Mr. Knox an honorary do the math tile oh, for installation and on the countertop. Oh, but that's not all. In order to congratulate everybody in the class, we are giving every single member of this room a gift certificate to McDonald's good for one free Happy Meal. Everybody in this room gets to cash in on that. So let's go ahead and pass those out. Congratulations to everybody. Uh, 9 is 11, and you keep a denominator, which is 12. And 11 take away 6 is 5, and it's 5 and 11 twelfths. And once again, congratulations to that fifth grade class over at Noble Elementary School. It is so much fun <laughs> to like just show up on campus and they have no idea what's going on. I mean, the teacher does because I tell them, uh -huh. you know, that we're going to be there. But uh, a lot of the office staff have no idea what's going on. Uh, the kids have no idea what's going on. And then all of a sudden we show up and boom, let's hand out some prizes and do some things. And uh, that's neat to get them on TV and, and you know, uh, giving those prizes and things, yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. Hey, you know what, speaking of a lot of fun, all you have to do is call Do The Math, and if we do your math problem on air, well, today we're just about out of time, but we'll extend this to tomorrow, because Kaylee got herself a ticket to the March Meet final day, the drag racing at Famosa Raceway, nice. coming up Sunday. So every single student tomorrow, the phone's in and we do your math problem on air tomorrow, you are automatically going to see the drag racing. Have you been out there? No, I never have. Well, you know what? Maybe you can call in and you can get you out to the drag <laughs> race tomorrow. Anyway, let's head out one more time out to uh, College Heights with Devin. Thank you very much, Mike. We're here with Sarah, sixth grade. Now we're looking at inequalities. So let's take a look at a problem from your book. You had this right up here. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was, you know, remember what this symbol means when it's switched, what is it? And I always use this little tip that I got from Mr. Mansky at Staten Island Academy my Three sophomore year. Take a look at that symbol. Here we go. Tilt your head a little bit and all of a sudden you have the symbol for less than. Regardless, let's take a look at this inequality. We have 2 tenths G is 
greater than 1.8. And Sarah, you were given the task of graphing this on an open number line. Well, we've got to really figure out how to isolate that variable first, that g. And you said something really interesting about decimals. You said that you didn't necessarily like dealing with them a lot, right? It was kind of messy. We've all been there. So what can we do with these decimals to make them easier for you to work with? We could turn them into fractions. Let's turn them into fractions. How do we represent 2 tenths as a fraction? How do we represent that in fraction form? Thinking about the place value. Well, what did we call this value? 2 tenths? So how do we write that as a fraction? 2 over 10. 2 over 10. Interesting thing here, you could simplify this, but you don't necessarily need to before you're done with it. Let's take a look at this value now, 1.8. How can we represent that as a fraction? 1 over 8. 1 over 8, is that the same thing? As, well, how, let's say this, 1 and 8 tenths. How can we say that as a fraction? Eight, one and eight tenths. One and eight tenths, right? See, that's why it's better to say the place value name instead of the decimal point, because now you can visualize it as a fraction. So what we're really saying here is two tenths times g is greater than one and eight tenths. In order to get the g by itself isolated, what do we need to do to both sides? Divide. Let's divide both sides by that coefficient of two tenths. Again, you could have reduced this to one fifth. And you could have done the same thing over here to 1 and 4 fifths, but you don't need to. Let's go ahead and divide both of these by 2 tenths. Now, dividing by fractions is actually very familiar. And you brought something interesting up. We went ahead and turned this into an improper fraction. 18 tenths divided by 2 tenths. And traditionally, students are taught to flip and multiply by that reciprocal. But in this case, could you divide straight across? You ever think about that? Let's divide these fractions straight across when they have the bare denominator. So we have 18 divided by 2 is 9. 10 divided by 10 is 1. So 18 tenths divided by 2 tenths is 9 over 1, 9. So let's put that back into our inequality. What we're saying is g is greater than 9. So let's go ahead and put this on the open number line here. Instead of starting at 0 and going all the way to 9, why don't we just put 9 right there? Now, is g greater than 9 or less than 9? So we're going to fill in all of the values greater than 9, which on a number line would be this way. Now, does g include 9? Is 9 greater than 9? No. No, it's not. So what about this dot? Does that have to be open or closed? Open. Open to leave it out. Sarah, g is greater than 9. Nicely done for you. Getting math done here at College Heights. All right, nicely done over there at College Heights with Devin and all of those students. All of the students that did problems with Devin today, as well as Kaylee, who phoned in a little bit earlier, is eligible for a family four pack to go see the Bakersfield Condors. Right now, we'll draw that name. Okay. Find out who it is. And it is Sarah from College wow. Heights. All right, there you go, our final contestant. There you are, Sarah, going to see the Condors. Got a four pack, so congratulations on that. Until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do the Math has been provided by Chevron. The Kern County Superintendent of Schools, California Resources Corporation, Kern County Water Agency, Southern California Edison, Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, and Panama Buena Vista Union School District. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.